All right, everybody, welcome back to Josh Does Movies. This is the first non-YouTube short video I'm doing for the channel in quite some time. And I thought, you know, with 2023 coming, I'm going to be making uh, more short reviews, and every week I'll be going over what I like on Mondays. But I figured the best way to start out on January 2nd here is to do a best of 2022 movie. And instead of making a boring list of top 10 movies, I decided to do the Joshkers. This is going to be my take on kind of the Oscars and their categories, going over the movies that I personally liked and kind of having this cool little fun experiment of thinking back of what movies I think did each individual thing the best. And sometimes there's movies that I don't particularly like, but I can't deny that they had great craftsmanship and great um, behind the camera work being done or even on the camera work being done either by talent and acting or talent in the creative arts with makeup, costumes, production design, even things like score. Um, so without further ado, let's look over our categories that I'm going to have here on the Joshkers. Let me just come over here and click that correctly. Yes. So categories are going to be in this. They won't come in this order, but I, I made them in my own order to kind of the mirror of the Oscars. But we have lead actor, lead actress, supporting actor, supporting actress, animated film, cinematography, costume design, screenplay, directing, film editing, makeup and hairstyle, score, picture, production design, sound, and visual effects. And without further ado, let's get into our first category. Best Makeup and Hairstyling. This was an interesting one because right away we see Babylon getting a nomination. This is a movie that personally I think had um, a, a lot going on. I didn't particularly love. But again, I can't deny a lot of the craftsmanship that went into this movie uh, being in the 1920s, early 1930s time period. The makeup and hairstyling was, was pretty fantastic in this movie. Um, next up is going to be Elvis, another movie here um, with Austin Butler and um, Tom Hanks being the two main leads, kind of going through all the different time periods. The makeup work done on Austin Butler for Elvis was pretty impressive. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. I think it had an amazing job in makeup with all the different type of worlds and the different multiverses that took place. We have... Roll of Dolls, the total of the musical. You can watch it on Netflix now. I think the makeup work done on Emma Thompson was pretty uh, amazing. I think the makeup work in the movie is pretty underrated. And finally, The Whale, which with Brendan Fraser um, playing that main character and all the prosthetics and makeups that had to go into his character and his and his uh, you know um, job. I think, again, another example of transforming a character and a person into something that you couldn't even tell. I couldn't tell when I watched The Whale if Brendan Fraser really gained all that weight um, or I couldn't tell if it was makeup and hairstyling. Um, and without further ado, the winner of the first Joshker of the night goes to Babylon. Again, the whole cast and everything that was going on in the 1920s there, I think it just had the best makeup and hairstyle with all the actors and actresses. Really hit it in that time period, done very well. There's no skim job on any of the extras or anything like that. So the first Joshker goes to Babylon. Next up is going to be the best costume design. And similarly, like, like I said, with makeup and, hair and, and hairstyling, Babylon gets nominated for the craftsmanship of the movie and the timepiece. Um, don't worry, darling. I I really like the costume design of kind of like the 1950s and 60s feel they had of the characters um, and, and what they, you know, all the costumes they had them in. Um, Elvis, again, hit hit that same time period. They really nailed down Elvis's outfits very, very well. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once for similar reasons of having the multiverse storyline. I think it did a really cool job of showing a bunch of different costumes in a bunch, bunch of different worlds. And the Northmen. I love the Northmen's costume design, kind of coming from that old Nordic Viking type feel. And it wasn't too many costumes, but I really thought it was detailed and it really felt grounded in, in that world. Um, and the winner for best costume design is Everything Everywhere All at Once. Again, all the different the different multiverse worlds they went through and all the different costumes they brought into it. I think it really added to the visual flair of this movie it really added character and substance and I, I just personally feel it had the best costume design by far of any movie that came out in 2022 
Now, best visual effects. These are going to be your CGI and the visual effects that take place in the movie. Um, again, a craftsmanship category for movies that maybe I didn't love this year, but I cannot deny the hard work that went behind it. First nomination is going to be Avatar The Way of Water. This was a movie I personally did not enjoy the story. I thought it felt very, very long, but you can't deny the work that's done with CGI in this movie by James Cameron and all the animators that work on it is truly phenomenal. It does not... It feels very real in a lot of different points. Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Um, I think the Neymar sheet scenes and all the underwater scenes were done very well. Um, just, again, another well visual effect movie. Um, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness had a lot of great visual effects for the multiverse in different types of ways. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, again, I think it did really great visual effects on a budget. Um, it really did hit that multiverse angle uh, um, very, very well. Visually appealing type movie. And then Top Gun Maverick. This is one that's harder to say because its visual effects were a whole lot more practical instead of the CGI type way. And I think Top Gun Maverick did very, very good at illustrating and using kind of real-life camera angles to give some great visual effects. But is there any doubt on what's going to win this, this, this Joshker? It is Avatar The Way of Water. The movie is very beautiful. It's three hours of some of the best CGI work that's ever been done. Whether you see it in 3D or 2D, I think you can really appreciate all the work that's been done for the visual effects of this movie. And it's a well-deserved Joshker for it in 2022. Now, next category is Best Sound. So th this is kind of a mix of sound editing and sound mixing. This isn't probably the best category for me to judge, but I thought, you know what, I'll give it a shot. So Babylon, again, I think that's the sound... You know, editing and mixing of this movie is very well done. There's a lot of scenes that take place with music and um, and how it fluctuates through the whole scene. I think it's really, really impressive. The Batman as well um, is another one. I think we'll you know we'll see later on more discussions around the Batman in different categories. But I think the Batman had a really good sound design, really good sound mixing. It really added a dramatic sense to that movie. Bullet Train. This is, I think, an underrated movie that came out this year. And I think sound is one of the big things. A little, like, it had a lot of little sound effects that really, um, you know, played up on parts of the movie. Especially the scenes in The Quiet Car, I think, were just very well done for sound. Um, nope, another movie. I loved Nope this year. I loved the messaging and everything it had. Um, the sounds of the alien craft, per se... I think were very well done. I had very unique sounds, very chilling sounds, um, and they worked with the editing and mixing very well. No, nope, clearly one of my favorite movies of the year. Definitely sound played a big part in that. And then Top Gun Maverick. I think the way they played these pl the planes out and were able to handle the sound when you're flying and stuff like that. It made it gave it that extra real feeling and really put people in the seats and you could really experience that through. And without further ado, the best sound. Oscar goes to Top Gun Maverick, just like I was saying. I think the sound editing and the sound mixing of that movie really put you in the seat of the cockpit. I think it really made that more believable on top of the filming, you know, the film angles of the movie. I think it's a very underrated um, sound edited and sound made movie, and that's why I gave it my Oscar for the best sound of the year. Now, best production design. Again, leading off is Babylon. We have a lot of these Babylons. This is a movie that's very tough for me because I didn't enjoy too much the story of Babylon. I think it lost different ways. You can see my, my short review on it on the channel here. But I cannot deny, deny the craftsmanship that went on behind it. And Babylon's set pieces were so incredibly done. The production design on this movie was fantastic. I, I'm so sad the story didn't match up to everything else. But Babylon here is on best production design. Elvis, again, I think all the sets they did, the production design they did for Elvis, all the different stagecrafts and stuff, um, you know, transforming areas and making it look like a period piece, I think was very well done. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Had amazing production design, all different multiverses. I mean, the fact they took basically one building and they morphed a whole movie around it was, I think, incredible. And everything felt different throughout the movie. Um, the Fablemans, I think, had great production design. Um, again, another period piece, so maybe I'm a little bit biased with period, period pieces having great production design, but I just think whenever you're transforming the world into a different time period, it allows you to show off the production design aspect of the Fablemans, had really great production design on the, on the sets, 
um, where they were filming from. I, I really made me feel like we're in the 1960s, 1950s. And the final nominee is Top Gun Maverick, a more modern movie. I think the production design really made you feel like you were in the element there. And all the different type of designs that they had to do to get the film in this movie, I think, were pretty, pretty under remarkable and um, really top notch. Now, the Josker goes to everything, everywhere, all at once. Again, how they transform basically one FBI building in a laundromat into this major picture that feels like there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, it feels like a rush. It doesn't feel like you you know have ever have a chance to stop and breathe, but in a positive way, um, really gave the edge to everything, everywhere, all at once in this category, and it's why it's my best production design winner of 2022. Now, I hate having to make a best animated film category because I think the the medium of animation is deserving to be on its you know to be seen at the level of as the top movies of the year. Maybe there'll be an animated movie or two in my top um, best picture nominations, but we'll see. But I have to give love to animators because they do so much work and they produce so much good content both on television and TV that usually gets forgotten about. Um, and without further ado, the best animated film category nominees are Bell. A foreign film from Japan. I know it came out for a lot of people in 2021, but for me here in Boise, it came out in 2022. Um, it was a beautiful film, a good take on Beauty and the Beast, but it had really great adult moments at, you know, as well. Um, I, I really recommend people see this film. Um, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, another amazingly animated film. This one's going to be on Netflix. Um, I, it's a different take on Pinocchio than you used with the Disney classic, but I think Guillermo del, uh, del Toro does an amazing job with this movie, and he is such a artistically made, you know, visual director, um, and it was really, really, really a stunning movie, and I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, Lightyear, um, this was Pixar's big motion picture that made it to theaters. I really enjoyed elements of this movie. I think the animation was, was very well done. I think it had a, a really decent message to it. Um, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, is one that is in theaters currently. I have family that went and saw it yesterday. I, I saw it last week. Um, I, I enjoyed this movie a lot. I think it has, again, a really good messaging in it. A lot of stuff for both adults and kids to like. The animation is a lot more French-like. I think you're seeing it. Be, I think it's... It still has that DreamWorks flair, but it's starting to mesh, mesh a little bit in there with something like you saw out of the French studio Fortiche with Arcane. Um, I love this movie in terms of its animation and stuff. I think it's really enjoyable. I think it's a great watch with the family. And the final one is Turning Red on Disney+. Plus. Now, this one um, I think was probably uh, an a, a underrated, unwatched movie, but if you have Disney Plus, definitely go and see it. A coming of age movie. Pixar does these stories very, very well. Um, definitely emotional in different places. I think it shows Canada and Toronto, as well as um, different, you know, the different uh, foreign elements of Toronto, very, very well. Again, if you have Disney Plus, I recommend Turning Red a whole lot. But now, what is my best winner of the best animated film that I saw in 2022? It is Belle. Um, this Japanese foreign film, um, I'm not sure what it's available on here in America, but it was a very powerful, very, very visual, stunning movie. Um, the story was very well done. The the I, I, I watched it in the with subtitles in Japanese, and the voice acting was tremendous. Um, and the story took me places I didn't think it would go. I really, really recommend people give this movie a chance if you have you know, if you have an eye, uh, if you can find it, but. That is my best animated film of 2022. Now we're on to best supporting actress. This is a category I think is going to be pretty loaded. I think for some, I might have some nominees or, that are surprised to some people. But Emma Thompson as Roald Dahl's Matilda the Musical. She plays the um, the kind of the school headmaster. I didn't realize it was Emma Thompson until the, the actual credits rolled. She does such an jo amazing job in this role as a supporting actress. She really, really makes you just like her. Um, but she has some tremendous moments, um, one, one great song. Um, but I thought Emma Thompson was amazing in this movie. Um, Angela Bassett in Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Um, she owned the screen when she was on the movie. I think she had some very, two very powerful speeches um, that took place in the movie. I think she also had really tender moments with um, Letitia's right Shuri. Um, Angela Bassett was was one of the main driving forces of a very good Black Panther Wakanda Forever. 
Jamie Lee Curtis in Everything Everywhere All at Once, another Best Supporting Actress role that was, I think, just amazing. She plays a very minor character that, in a very major way. She was able to show different type of ranges in different ways. I, I love Jamie Lee Curtis in this movie. And then Hong Chow and the Whale. Um, I just you know saw this recently. Um, she plays um, the best friend of the main character, um, a nurse character. Um, she hits a lot of different range of, of emotions. Um, as I was watching the movie, I was like, she's really delivering a powerful performance. And she's making me emotionally moved. And I had to give her a lot of love for that. Um, and with the winner, though, we have Angela Bassett. I think Angela Bassett carried this movie. I think it was a phenomenal acting job. I think if there's anything you can take away from Black Panther Wakanda Forever is that she is a powerhouse and well-deserving of this type of award. And it's kind of exactly what you're looking for in a supporting actress you know, character as well as a supporting actress individual. Next up is Best Supporting Actor. We have ki Hu Kwan from Everything Everywhere All at Once playing uh, Michelle Yeoh's character's husband. Judd Hirsch and The Fablemans. He's in very, very, very short scene. He's almost more of a guest actor than Best Supporting Actor, but he leaves an impact with you and the characters involved. He goes all out with his acting role as... Uh, Sammy's uncle, um, I, and it just left me like jaw dropped. I was the minute I saw, I was like, "This he is he is getting nominated for my best supporting actor." That is that was a phenomenal jump out of the screen acting moment for me that I've seen recently. Um, William Defoe in The Northman. Um, I misspelled The Northman here, but hey, I didn't really edit and check this out. So, but hey, but no, he again, he's a very short role in the very beginning of the movie. Um, but William Defoe always finds a way to deliver on these supporting actor roles. He is such a big, vibrant character um, and really adds a whole lot to the movie. Um, and just that opening scene and giving you the tones of what's going on. Um, and then we have Stanley Tucci in I Want to Dance with Somebody. Um, I think his role at, as the produce, produce hell, you know, the, the main producer, um, Clive Davis, I think really was the foundation that made this movie work. Um, I think, you know, the, um, the lead actress who played Whitney Houston did a tremendous job as well. But Stanley Tucci as a Best Supporting Actor, I think, really kept the film moldable. And it really gave, you know, he was able through his performance and his, you know, his being able to perform and connect with the uh, Whitney Houston's character um, really cemented that film as being passable for me. Um, so I, I had to give Stanley Tucci the nomination here for Best Supporting Actor. And the final one is Brian Tyree Henry and Bullet Train. Again, I'm going to be higher on Bullet Train than I think a lot of people are, but B Brian Tyree Henry making Thomas the Tank Engine into like a really emotional and key part to a movie without really thinking about it, I think, I think was very, very well done. I think um, he did a lot of great acting ranges. He added a lot of comedy to it. I really recognize Brian Tyree Henry for just the work that he did in Bullet Train, and I think his character is one of the reasons why I enjoy the movie so well. But who gets the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor? Ki Hu Kwan in Everything Everywhere All at Once. This acting job by him, his first basic one back to the big screen in almost two or three decades, was phenomenal. We may know him a short round from Indiana Jones or Data from The Goonies, but him in this role was just transformative. He played so many different type of characters. He hit so many different type of ranges. He was kind of the keystone figure in Michelle Yeoh's character. Um, I can't say anything more positive about Ki Hua Kwan and everything all at where um, everything everywhere all at once in his role in that movie. A well deserved Oscar um, and a very strong category here in my opinion. Now moving back to more craftsmanship, we have best score. Um, I love score music. I think it's the most underrated thing that people don't realize has an effect on movies. Things like Star Wars, The Godfather, Indiana Jones, um, Jurassic Park. So many great movies last through time through their music. And I think this is a category that is very important and it's very, very um, telling um, and, and, you know, of what what's makes a movie work. So... We have Robert Carolone and Sebastian Gainsborough from The Northman. John Williams, The Fablemans. Mikel Abales and Nope. 
and then Justin Hurwitz in Babylon. This was a tough one to go through. I think things like The Northman um, and Nope, I mean, all of these movies, I think there's one more, Michael G. G. I was thinking, why is the Batman not showing up as a nomination? I was like, that was clearly a great score and one of the best ones of the year, if not the best one. We'll find out if it wins the Josh Oscar here in a second. But Michael Giacano um, in The Batman, um, all of these movies had great scores that really kept me interested and engaged throughout. Um, whether it's Nope's more quiet score, playing with different music and, and vocal things when things are happening, um, Babylon having a great score, kind of representing that time period. The Batman having an, a very intense, and, and, and like the Northman, having a very intense and a very extreme score that puts you on the edge of your seat. Um, in The Fablemans, John Williams just creates magic over and over again. You know, We have Beethoven, we have Bach, we have uh, all of these great people that we know from past time. John Williams in 500 years is going to be one of those people that we look back as a a truly marvel and a masterpiece of a of a of a musician and creator, um, and his score of the Fableman really were able was able to bring out the emotional aspects of the movie, and it ties so well into Steven Spielberg's directional work um, to just make some movie magic. And with that, the Oscar for the best score goes to John Williams. Um, again, I think the score was the best part of the Fablemans. I think John Williams is a, a master in music and a master in, in understanding human emotion. Can't deny, I think a lot of me, you know, giving this best score might also come with the fact this might be my last chance to ever award him as best score. He's only doing one more movie with the new Indiana Jones movie coming up here, but um, I think it's very well deserved for the Fablemans. I think John Williams is just uh, something we'll never understand um how just important and how amazing he was it's going to take i think years and years and years for i mean we already know he's amazing and important and we know he's like the best of the best but i think we don't understand just how beautiful and how masterful he was and i think it's going to take a long time removed for uh, people to realize just the incredible individual he is as, as a as a conductor and a musician um Moving on to a next category, we have Best Film Editing. Bullet Train. I think Bullet Train did a lot of great film editing of, high, of these action sequences. I think it also tied in a lot of parts of the story very well. Um, very different editing style than you're used to. Everything Everywhere All at Once had amazing film editing going through all the different type of multiverses, keeping the story, very, um, you know, things not, you know, be too long, not be too short. The Northmen, I think, had great film editing as well. I think the way it was able to tell the story, how it was able to hold on scenes in certain areas, transition to other scenes, I think it was just edited very, very well. The Menu was a movie that I think was edited supremely well. I think this is the first time The Menu has showed up on this uh, this video. Um, just being able to do most of the movie in that kind of one area, but the editing back and forth between characters with all the different camera angles was so well done, it made you realize that um, it felt just like you were t you're taking part in the evening with these characters, and the editing hit itself so well in terms, you know, of not noticing the jars and not noticing the jumps. Um, There's really great film editing um, coming out of the menu. And then Top Gun Maverick, I think, had great film editing of all the different plane sequences, um, being able to make it feel con continuously through like one big giant action scene. Um, just really amazing work from Top Gun Maverick and the Josker goes to Top Gun Maverick. Again, like I, I, I knew it was going to win here, so I wanted to go more in depth after I, I gave it the award, but I think the difficulty of being able to edit in like action sequences from people who are actually flying planes where you know the the filming of the planes where they're flying them making it you know very simple flying patterns feel like life or death scenarios making it feel like the big you know um moments um like it was something that was professionally done i think really is what made top gun maverick amazing um for a lot of people including myself it really the film editing allowed you to feel like you were in the cockpit that everything was going on that was dangerous they took very like i said took very simple uh plane flying designs and the editing and everything turned it into uh on the the, the edge of your seat action sequences best cinematography um 
all quiet on the Western Front. I finally got to watch this this morning. Um, this was a German film um, set in World War II. It's a remake of a former Best Picture winner, and the cinematography in this movie is just very, very well done. All you know, I think war scenes is you know war you know World War Two, World War One is is one of the best places you can do for cinematography. I think it allows you to to venture into ways in the show kind of the gruesomeness of the world at that time. But All Quiet on the Western Front really delivered on the cinematography for a movie kind of as grand as a scale. Um, Babylon, again, there are moments in Babylon where the camera work is so masterfully done. There's like a big scene where you have a bunch of um, kind of, you know, silent films being made. And there's like a scene taking place with Brad Pitt's character in a very big silent film, it seems like. And it was just shot so masterfully. Um, Babylon has great cinematography. Um, the Fablemans, and again, the work on the camera here, you get to see, like, to be able to, to show, like, the Spielbergian magic and camera shots and stuff like that. And in a movie where the characters is doing these shots and, and showing the magic of them and the impact of them at that time and everybody else's reaction to them as they happen, I think this, the, it's just, Fableman's cinematography was quite amazing. Um, it's, you know, Steven Spielberg and his camera crew that he works with mostly just do something that nobody else really does very, very well consistently. Um, the Northmen with the, with the scenes in the north, um, you know, in Iceland and in Norway and in England were just so well, well shot. It felt very real. The movie felt very real. It really transported me back as if I was living in that Viking era. Um, amazing cinematography there. And then Top Gun Maverick, which... I think the cinematography, again, of those planes, filming inside the planes, having the actors really be a part of it and showing and making you feel like this was actually taking place, all these things were happening, really, really showing, you know, giving you the feel of reality in a, in a, in a movie that we're not used to seeing a reality thing in when it comes to planes flying in the air and stuff like that. Which is why... Top Gun Maverick wins best cinematography. The camera work was amazing. How practical it was and how they shot it in a way really just highlighted a, a part of the movie that I think made it the success that it was. Without the cinematography as good as it was, Top Gun Maverick would not be the hit that I think it became. And I think it's well-deserving of the Cinematography Award of the Year um, for the amazing camera work and the amazing... Um, uh, just work that was done on this film to highlight the practical use of planes and to make it feel real and grounded. Um, just great work by Top Gun Maverick and their crew there. Best screenplay. This is an interesting one because I think this is one that is less about craftsmanship and more about what I enjoyed in the year. Um, so I think you see more of my flair of movies that I might, you know, will probably rank in my top, you know, best picture nominee category or not. But I, I just, I think... Th this was one where I was like, oh, screenplay, finally, something that isn't just craftsmanship that I have to kind of judge outside of the base quality of the movie in terms of whether I liked it or not. But screenplay, you had to have a good screenplay that I liked to be nominated for this category, and that is Bullet Train. I love the screenplay of Bullet Train. I love how all of these people come together in different ways and it weaves itself out in ways that kind of, you know, make sense in the movie. It doesn't lose me at all. It's, it's funny when it needs to be funny. It's sad when it needs to be sad. It's it's enthralling when it needs to be enthralling. I love Bullet Train and the screenplay that take place in this movie. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. Another amazing screenplay that is sh you know we're seeing everywhere, everything you know everything everywhere all at once show up in a lot of these categories. But I think the multiverse storyline that we're, they were able to tell in this movie would still have it be very much about the characters um, and the under you know and what what was going through in in the, in the life of the characters at that moment. I think this was an amazing screenplay um, in one of the best of the year. Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery makes its first appearance. Um, this is a movie that I think the screenplay could be very basic for some people, but I really enjoyed the twisty elements of it. I love the way it was um, set up and and where the movie ended up going. I don't want to spoil it because not everybody has seen the movie so far, but I think the screenplay did very, very well and it made my best top five list of best screenplay of 2022. The Menu, this was another screenplay that truly I, I just loved. I didn't know what to expect with The Menu, but going in, um, just sitting down, it's kind of the class commentary that you have in this movie, um, the different type of elements and, and characters you have involved there and what they represent. Um, 
the different you know you know the lines that people are giving it's a very powerful it was a very powerful movie for me i thought it was very entertaining it was very suspenseful um in the screenplay of the movie to be you know like i guess the, the, the production design of the movie i think was very well done um but the fact that the story was so rich and so great to be able to be filmed pretty much in a one room location um i think a lot of that goes down to a great screenplay um that really helped carry the movie and gave actors a chance to really act out some amazing roles. And finally, The Whale. Um, this was a movie that was very powerful for me. I think you only really have four or five characters in the movie, maybe six if I'm thinking about it you know, overall. Um, but the screenplay and the journey that we go on in the, in, the, in the few days that we have with these characters was really powerful, was really on point. I understood how, you know, where things were. And there were some things that I thought were, you know, geared to a certain character that ended up being something else in the end. Um, it, I, I was emotionally moved. It left a big impact. Um, maybe some recency bias with the screenplay, but I, I really, really love the whale screenplay, and I can't say enough about it. And the Joscar for best screenplay goes to the whale for all those reasons as I said. I think it was just just an amazing movie in terms of what it was trying to do and what it was trying to show. Um, it was was not an easy watch. Um, it definitely had its moments that were uncomfortable. But I really felt connected a lot to the screenplay and what the story was trying to tell and, you know, the, the positives and the negatives of each character and um, just an amazing screenplay. If, if, if you're looking for a, a emotion, an emotional movie that's going to leave an impact on you, I, I recommend you go see The Whale right now. I think it's the most emotionally impacting movie you have in theaters at the moment. All right, now we're going to best lead actor. Back to more of the people who I thought brought, you know, who led their movie and brought life to the screen and really um, made the movie enjoyable for me. Um, Brendan Fraser, The Whale. Nothing, not, I can't say enough about his range of emotions and his range of facial expressions um, in this movie. His, his, his tone of his voice um, it was a masterclass performance and um, I, just one that I really, really enjoyed. And I knew it was going to be tough. And he made it tough on me um, to watch. Um, but that's exactly what they were going for. And I can't say enough positive about Brendan Fraser in this role. I think if anybody ever doubted him as an actor, I think with this with this role on The Whale, he, he put that to sleep. He is, he is a world-class actor and I hope he gets more opportunities. Maybe not in a way where he has to gain a lot of weight. But I hope he gets more opportunities to show his acting range like he had in this movie. Austin Butler and Elvis. Another movie where I think an actor really transcended a character and took, you know, was able to show different ranges of emotions, was able to show a young, vibrant Elvis into an older Elvis that was dealing with drug issues. Um, Austin Butler um, delivered a, a masterful, a master um, full performance and he really made me feel like I was watching Elvis throughout um, I think he was the heart and soul of this movie he is the you know I'm not saying everything else wasn't you know why the movie worked but Austin Butler is the number one movie why this movie worked so well for me um, and if you love Elvis and you love music I really recommend going to see it it's eye-opening kind of you know behind the scenes stuff that I never realized with, with, with how Elvis was taken advantage of but Austin Butler's performance as Elvis was truly um, remarkable and was my favorite part of that movie that came out uh, in the summer of this year. Ralph Fiennes in The Menu. Oh my gosh, he plays the lead chef that is hosting this cooking uh, cookout party. And he makes you, like, crawl. Like, he makes the hair on your back just stick up so much because you don't know what he's going to do. He has a point in what he's saying. Um, he is very, very, very um, stern with his tone. I think he just gives a tremendous performance. He gives some extra ranges there. He makes every bit of the movie un unknowing where it's going to go. You don't know how his character is going to act. You're scared of him, but you're also intrigued by him. You're wondering what's there. Um, Ralph Fiennes, man, he did an amazing job acting in this movie. Um, and... He made my best actor list, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that he gets nominated for best 
lead actor come the Oscars because I think this is a movie that um, wasn't presenting itself as an awards candidate when it came out. But be, I, I generally think that there's a lot of great things to come out of the menu, as we've seen with my nominations here. Um, and Ralph Fiennes is, is, is just 100% one of them. Um, Colin Farrell and the Banshees of Inner, Inner Sheeran. Um, this is a fun little movie that I watched in two parts. Um, I should probably go back and rewatch it as a whole. Um, I really enjoy the second half of the movie with Colin Farrell's performance kind of being this what's considered a dull individual, figuring out why somebody he considered a friend doesn't want him as a, a friend anymore. Um, I think Colin Farrell hits a lot of different ranges here very, very well. I think he's going to be a big contender for lead actor with Brendan Fraser um, for the for the Oscars. Um, this was a movie that I won't lie. When I stopped watching it, I was like, I don't maybe if I get back to it, but I wasn't too intrigued. But the second half of the movie really bought me in, um, and I think Colin Farrell is a big part of that. And finally, Alexander Skarsgård and the Northman. This is a lot more physical. Um, and a much more, uh, yeah, the, the, the physical type acting job. He definitely sh showed some, you know, his range in different places emotionally. Um, but I think Alex getting the scars guards, kind of that Viking mentality. He really felt like the character that was being played, um, the brutality that he went through and the people around him went through, um, I think was just very well done. And I, you know, I think the Northman is a movie that I personally enjoyed a whole lot. And a lot of that did come down to Alexander Skarsgård in that role. But the winner for Best Lead Actor at the Joshkers in 2022 goes to Brendan Fraser. I can't speak enough about how he worked this role in The Whale. It was powerful. It was moving. Again, it was probably, like, it might be recency biased, but it left the biggest impact of me. And I think Brendan Fraser um, just did such an amazing job in this movie of a wide range of emotions. He really made you feel for him, but also not feel for him. He he handled a lot of different things very, very well. Like I said, it's a very, very emotionally tough movie. Um, and Brendan Fraser was able to hold that level the whole way through. I cannot say enough great things. Um, he's obviously my best lead actor for the Oscars. I hope this leads into many awards for him coming into 2023 with the Oscars whatever, and all the other award shows. Um, and I hope that we see more of him in uh, these big, powerful roles um, because I think he is a truly phenomenal actor. And anybody like me who might have had doubts that he was nothing more than just kind of a, a typecast type character, they're, they're gone. He is, he is a world-class actor, um, and he proved it in The Whale. Best Lead Actress... We have Anya Taylor-Joy in The Menu, and I think she, um, as her character, who is there not as one of the intended guests, does very, very, very well. I think I love where she's at in the, you know, in the story. Her reacting to all these different characters was very well done. I think just with Ralph Fiennes, you weren't sure what, what choice she was going to make and how she was going to do it. She, her and Ralph Fiennes carry this movie so, so well and makes it such like a enjoyable, mystique dick suspenseful ride um i loved anya taylor joy in the menu anya taylor joy gets nominated again for the northman um she plays a slave that ends up fall you know that ends up falling in love um with alex gander skarsgård's character and i think she hits a lot more emotional range of notes here um i wasn't sure if she'd be best supporting or best lead but when i watched the movie back over she's clearly a lead in my eyes um, and everything she does in this movie and how impactful she was, where she was going for, she was the emotional heart and, and the emotional latch on for me as a viewer. Um, and I think Anya Taylor-Joy in both these movies, but it's funny, you have somebody nominated twice you know, for a category, I think is interesting, but um, I think she's such a talented actress and the emotional um, kind of pull she brings on me in The Northman um, really stood out to me, and it, it, it's, it's a, a performance that still sticks with me, and I remember throughout the year, um, and I can't say enough positive things about Anya Taylor-Joy. I think she is going to be the Meryl Streep of our, my generation. I really, really hope that she starts getting more and more acknowledgement, and she's able to get more of these nominations, and we can really start seeing her flourish, because she's young, she's talented, and maybe I'm biased, but I have her nominated twice here, because I think she deserves it for two roles. Kate Blanchett and Tar. 
Um, Tar was a movie I didn't particularly enjoy that well, except for the fact that Kate Blanchett in it um, was a rock star of a character. Um, I think she led this movie very, very well. She made it passably enjoyable for me. Um, I think that sh- you know she's gonna be up for a lot of not you know awards you know because of this role, and I think it's well deserved. Again, I wasn't the biggest fan of Tar, um, but Kate Camp- Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett in the movie was a was a powerhouse rock star and owned the screen the whole movie. Florence Pugh in Don't Worry Darling, um, another person in a movie I didn't quite enjoy, but Florence Pugh's acting range in Don't Worry Darling was quite amazing. I think she handled it very very well. I think again she made the movie bearable to watch. Um, her range of emotions, her her feeling out of control and feeling in control. Um, some of the scenes she had there, um, you know, like the dinner scene where she had with Chris Pine and every and everybody else were just so just on point and well done. I think Florence Pugh was another young actress that, as we get older, I think we're going to start seeing her and Anya Taylor Joy just take over uh, the the best actress category for you know for the Oscars, um, and she just has so much great range and she puts you everything she wants into a character when she's given the chance and that's why she's nominated here for best lead actress even in a movie that i didn't enjoy as much finally we have michelle yo as in everything everywhere all at once um i don't think enough can be said about michelle yo's character here there's action that's involved with her um there's comedy there's there's heart there's um there's sadness there's joy there's so many different ranges of character. I think Michelle Yeoh is a rock star of an actress, and she's overdue for a role like this, and I think that she was given a role, and she hit it out of the park. Everything, everywhere, all at once was a masterpiece of a film for me, and Michelle Yeoh was a the, the, the centerpiece of that masterpiece. She was able to act many different roles, show diff- many different ranges of emotions, um, and was able to connect to her, herself and the audience in a much better way than I think anybody else probably has on this category doesn't mean she's going to win it but i i I generally um can't say enough positive about michelle yo and everything everywhere all at once and without further ado the best lead actress goes to michelle yo everything everywhere all at once like i said i think she hit more range than everybody else did this year i think she nailed the whole thing through i think she was phenomenal on this role um and it's a well-deserved joscar for michelle yo Best Director. We have two categories left. I know it's almost 45 minutes, but we're at Best Director. Um, and that we have Daniel Kwan and Daniel Skygenert from Everything Everywhere All at Once. Robert Eggers in The Northman. Mark Milod in The Menu. Jordan Peele in Nope. And Darren Aronofsky in The Whale. Tough category to go through. These are five movies that I think the directors really had an impact on in both the the camera work, the film, the editing, the the movies. These movies felt whole and really hit me um, the most in terms of impact that I felt the directors wanted me to have. Um, And the Oscar for Best Director goes to Robert Eggers in The Northman. I think the way he was able to tell a story that may feel familiar to all of us was very well done. It really left an impact with me. Um, just being able to direct everybody and make you feel like you're in that that medieval time Viking world, I think was tremendous. And Robert Eggers takes home the best director category for me because of that feeling. But all five of these directors really left, you know, put me in a, a, a world and a movie that I felt was grounded and real and I felt like I was really there. And that's why all five of them are nominated for best director. And finally, like the Oscars, we'll have 10 movies here, which are going to be my de facto 10 best movies of the year um, for best picture. A lot of things changed here in the last couple days, but um, let's see what these 10 nominees are going to be. Starting out, All Quiet on the Western Front. Again, a very powerful, very well-done German film um, uh, in World War II. I know it's a remake, but I've never seen the first one. And I just, I just watched this this morning. It left a really big impact on me. I think it's a movie, if you like wartime movies, I definitely recommend to check out. Don't let the German aspect turn you off. Foreign films are amazing, and we need to give more foreign films like Parasite, um, All Quiet in the Western Front, chances, um, because I think there's really great film um, work being done out in these markets. 
the Banshees of Inner Sheeran. Again, I finished watching this one last night. Um, it was a really, really, really good second half of the movie. I really enjoyed it. I think Colin Farrell is a phenomenal actor in this. Um, this is one I definitely recommend if you're going to sit down and watch a movie. It's a little bit slower paced, but um, if you like kind of that Irish type feel to it, I think Banshees of Inner Sheeran does it very, very well. Bell, our animated category winner, also makes it here. We have two foreign films so far in our top ten. Um, Bell, again, a very powerful, very great moving movie. Um, I love the story elements of it. It went ways that it wasn't expecting. I highly recommend people watch it and give it a chance. Bullet Strain. I said I'm higher up on this movie. The more and more I watch it, the more and more I enjoyed it. I watched it with a bunch of friends recently, and they loved it. And I was like, yes, this is as, this is as good as a movie as I feel. It's on Netflix right now. If you didn't see it in theaters, if you're looking kind of for a fun, action-y, comedy-type movie, um, Bullet Train really hits the, the, a home run in that. Um, I love Bullet Train. Brad Pitt, um, David Tyree Henry, Joey King. It has a loaded cast. Um, and it, just, again, it was just an enjoyable ride. Um, I also saw that one in theaters with my mom. I think that's the one movie I saw in theaters this year with my mom. Um, she lives about three and a half hours away. I don't get to see her as much as I'd like. Um, so I'm sure it has a, a kind of a sentimental, emotional impact on me as well. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. I don't think you could have a Best Picture nominee category this year without this movie for a lot of people. I think it was a tremendous, as we've seen, with how many awards it's won and been nominated for in the Joscars. Um, it was a tremendous film from start to finish. It told an amazing story about family and used the multiverse in a way to be just really, really artistic and impactful and really engaging. And clearly, I loved it a lot. It is on my Best Picture nominee list, but it's been nominated for so many other categories. Last Onion, A Knives Out Story. This was a movie that's probably on here because of the theater experience I had. Um, when I saw this in theaters on Thanksgiving Day, everybody was laughing. Everybody was having a good time. It truly was probably my favorite theater experience of the year. Um, I know the movie has some faults here and there, but it's one that I really, really did enjoy. It's on Netflix now. I think if you get a group of people who are going to be looking for a funny kind of happy movie, I think it's a great one to watch with a group of people. I'm a little bit tougher to watch by yourself, but um, a, a really great whodunit movie um, and one that I think is really enjoyed well with a, with a big audience. The Menu. This was a movie I, I almost missed, but I was like, you know what? I don't have anything to do around Thanksgiving. I'll go watch The Menu as well. And I was impressed and floored with this movie. The, the messaging it had kind of on culture, um, all the different type of actors and actresses that were involved in it. Um, the suspense nature of it, it was very much a on my seat. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who's safe. I don't know who's not safe movie. Um, I love the menu and everything that it brought. Um, one of my favorite movies of the year. Nope. This is a movie that I know a lot of people were disappointed with, but I understood the idea of spectacle and it taking over individuals. Um, and I, and that messaging really, you know, struck home with me. I thought it was done very, very well. I love the creative aspect of the of the alien, um, and, you know, the alien ship per se, and you know, and how it was creatively done and how that was made. Um, it was a very big, impactful movie, and it was one that I really, really enjoyed a whole lot. Um, I recommend it to people if you have HBO Max, give it a chance. Um, I I love Nope. I love Jordan Peele, so. Uh, it's it's a minority for best picture of top ten of the year. The Northman, this Robert Eggers movie, it's been nominated a lot. Um, I love this movie. I know it's people will think it's a Hamlet remake, but really this is a story that Hamlet was based on. Um, it really struck home with me um, in terms of everything that was going on with the characters. It put me in a world and put you know made me feel like I was truly in the eight, you know that uh, pre one you know thousand years. Um, in, in ways that I think a lot of movies fantasize about this. This one was not fantasy. This one was like, you really don't want to live in this time period. Um, it's gruesome. It's horrible. People live and people die over a lot of things. Um, you know, and I just thought it was a, a master class of a movie um, and one that I really enjoy. And it's on Amazon Prime Video. If you have Prime, you can watch that one for free. And the final nominee for my top ten movie of the year is The Whale. I've said a lot about this movie already. Um, it has six care people by you know six main characters. Um, powerful, powerful stuff. Um, Brendan Fraser, Sadie Sink, uh, Hung Chow, um, Darren Ar Arakoski. Just a well done, well made movie. 
really emotionally impactful. I went in knowing I was going to have to be vulnerable to enjoy this movie, and I'm so glad that I did. It was a, I don't know if everybody in my theater loved it. I, it, was, it was probably the most packed movie I've seen besides Avatar in the last month or so. But I really, really enjoyed The Whale and everything that it had there um, going for it. Uh, and it, it made it into my Best Picture nominee. So these are, these are my top ten movies of the year. I did them in alphabetical order. Because there's only going to be one winner of the Best Picture Joshker. And the Joshker goes to the Northman. Ooh, almost sneezed there. I apologize. But the Northman to me was just a magical movie. And it took me to a place I wasn't expecting. And it hit emotional moments. And it really went out of its way um, in ways that I truly enjoyed. Um, and I just love this movie throughout. I think the acting in it was tremendous. I think the filming and the directing of it was tremendous. I, I, it really stuck with me. I love the story of it. I love that um, it was gruesome. I love that it gave an accurate depiction of what the world might have been like back then. Um, and I can't say enough good things about this movie. Any of these 10 movies, I'd recommend people go and see um, under certain circumstances. Um, but The Northman wins my best picture and my best movie of 2022. And without further ado, tell me what your best movies are. This is a long video. It's gone 50 minutes. But I really wanted to give my thoughts on all the different categories and the different movies. Tell me what I got right. Tell me what I got wrong. Leave a like. Subscribe. Like I said, I'm going to be doing short YouTube short reviews for movies and TV shows um, as we move on in 2022. And then every Monday from here on out. I am going to do a what did I watch this week video that will release just going over the things I've watched and give more in-depth reviews on things per se. I'm going to try to keep those around 20 to 30 minutes. Um, this one's a little bit longer because it's a Josh girl. It's at 51, 52 minutes. But thank you for tuning in. I look forward to continuing this tradition next year and putting out a bunch of content that I hope people enjoy. Um, I wish everybody a happy new year, um, and I'll see you with 2023. Bye.